Good morning and welcome to this webcast. My name is Kelly Law from Matthews Folbig Lawyers and I look forward to presenting to the topic to you today regarding enforcement options. In this webcast, we will be addressing and exploring the various enforcement options available to Council, who they can be issued to and what they do. So at first instance, let's have a look at exactly what are enforcement options. Councils have the power to implement a variety of regulatory options to take action on individuals and businesses that have breached the laws that local government controls. Examples of enforcement options include warnings, notices, orders, and in some cases, prosecution, depending upon the seriousness of the offence. Council and enforcement officers exercise their discretion and certain delegated powers to select appropriate enforcement options that best address and resolve breaches. Powers of enforcement op options are conferred to Council under a variety of Acts of Parliament, including the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act, which we'll refer to as the EPNA Act in this webcast, the Protection of the Environment Operations Act, that we will refer to as the POE in this cast, and the Local Government Act, that we will refer to as the LGA going forward. So now let's have a look at exactly which enforcement option to choose. When selecting the most appropriate enforcement option, Council should take into consideration a number of factors. The New South Wales Ombudsman of Enforcement Guidelines of Councils sets out what sorts of matters need to be weighed when choosing an effective and appropriate enforcement option. These factors include, number one, the seriousness of the breach. Whether the offence was of a low, middle or high level of seriousness and the impact it had on the community and the environment. Minor offences of a low level of seriousness are offences that have a minimal impact on the person, the environment or community. They, the breach can be rectified or addressed in a short span of time and will no longer have a negative consequence once rectified. A formal caution or warning may also be issued. Moderate offences of a mid-level of seriousness are breaches of legislation which have a minimal impact on the environment, community, essential infrastructure, property or life, but could have a more severe and significant impact if an enforcement action is not taken. A notice of intention to serve a notice or order may be issued in this instance. Major offences of a high level of seriousness are breaches of legislation which have a significant impact on the environment, community, essential infrastructure, property or life. They are breaches which may not be addressed in a short span of time. A penalty notice may be issued in a more serious case. An injunction could also be sought at court to prevent unlawful activity or legal proceedings could be commenced. Number two, the appropriateness. When the selected enforcement option is proportionate to the nature of the breach and is consistent with the measures taken for previous similar breaches. Number three, the public interest test. Whether the enforcement option is in the best interest of the public will achieve the best outcome for the collective good and community welfare. Public interest considerations include the six Ps, personal interests of a decision maker, personal opinions, parochial interests, political interests, personal circumstances, and the private interests of a particular person. Number four, the recentness. Whether the proposed enforcement option will come within the relevant statute of limitations for the offence and how recently the breach was committed. Number five, the level of evidence that's required. Whether there is sufficient evidence available to prove the offence to take the necessary enforcement action. And number six, the offender's culpability. Whether the offender has a history of non-compliance and whether the offence was carried out recklessly or knowingly. Consideration of these matters, in our view, is crucial to selecting an appropriate enforcement option that is proportionate to the breach that is committed. Next, let's move on to the wide range and varied types of enforcement options that are available to councils. Generally speaking, in response to a breach of law that has been identified and proven, council can choose to record only as an option, issue verbal warnings, issue written warnings or cautions, issue penalty notices, issue notices or orders, issue enforceable undertakings, 
and commence prosecutions or civil proceedings in the relevant court. So let's have a look at these in more detail. Number one, record only. The option to record only means that officers with delegated authority will choose not to take action against very minor breaches and simply record the breach in a council record keeping system or in official notebooks. Number two, verbal warnings. Verbal warnings are oral evidence that can be given to individuals notifying them of the offence and cautioning them of the possibility of future action if non-compliances continue. Number three, written warnings or cautions. Written warnings or otherwise known as official cautions are written advices advising individuals of the offence. Appropriate measures that can be taken to remedy the offence as well as cautioning the individuals that action will be taken if there are continued breaches. Written warnings are an effective enforcement option because they provide what we consider to be a cost-effective method to resolve minor offences. They can educate offenders about legislative requirements and provide a written record for Council's purposes. Under Part 3 of the Fines Act, an authorised officer, when issuing a penalty notice, may give a person an official caution instead of issuing the penalty notice if the person believes, A, that on reasonable grounds the offender has committed a penalty notice offence, and B, it is appropriate to give an official caution in the circumstances. Now, as per the Attorney-General's caution guidelines under the Fines Act, Cautions can be issued in place of penalty notices in circumstances where the offence is of a small scale, where there is a history of compliance and where a warning will suffice to prevent the offender from committing the offence again in the future. However, cautions are not to be issued if the offender is not able to issue the person with a penalty notice for the same behaviour if the offence is one for which cautions may not be given in the issuing agency's own caution guidelines and if the alleged offender has an unlawful excuse. Number four, in terms of the different enforcement options that can be issued by council, is a penalty notice. Penalty notices are also commonly referred to as PINs, which in essence are fixed fines issued by the appropriate officers where an offence or a breach of the relevant approvals, roads and regulations appears to have been committed. Penalty notices primarily serve to punish and deter the offender and the wider community from repeating the offence in the future. Pins can be posted or issued on the spot to the alleged offender or in any other manner authorised by the statutory provisions providing for the issuing of penalty notices. Once issued to the recipient, the offender may either elect to pay the required fine within the prescribed period or elect to have the matter heard in court. It is important to note that the issue of a pin does not itself instigate court's proceedings. Whether the matter goes to court or not will be dependent upon the recipient of the penalty notice. In the instance that the alleged offender elects to pay the fine, payment of the fine will not garner a recording of a criminal conviction and is not to be regarded as an admission of liability for the purpose of and does not in any way affect or prejudice any civil claim, action or proceeding that may arise. On the other hand, if the alleged offender does elect to have the matter heard before a court, proceedings will be instigated in the criminal jurisdiction of the local court where the alleged offender if found to be guilty, the court may impose a significantly higher penalty than the specified amount on the notice. PINs are applicable under the LGA, the EPNA Act, the POE and many other legislative acts. To illustrate, let's take a look at the POE. Under section 91 of the POE, a penalty notice may be issued for a first time offence of failure to comply with a clean up notice, for example. The fine for such an offence is $4,000 for an individual and $8,000 for corporations. PINs are commonly utilised in situations where there is a minor, low, moderate breach, where there is a good chance that the penalty will deter the offender from repeating the offence, where there is a well-defined evidence to prove the offence and where the penalty can be issued relatively close to the time the offence was committed. 
the issuing of a penalty notice is not appropriate for offences that are of an ongoing nature and which require long-term solutions. It is also inappropriate when the penalty notice issued would be disproportionate to the seriousness of the offence, where the consequential damage of the offence cannot be promptly ascertained, where there have been multiple breaches and where the evidence would be insufficient to establish the offence before the court. Penalty notices, in our view, are a valuable enforcement option and a tool as they are cost-effective and easy to issue. They usually are not contested and the amount of fine operates as a viable deterrent in itself. However, in rare instances where the penalty notice is challenged in the court proceedings, they can potentially become quite time-consuming and expensive. In addition to this, payment of the fine does not in itself offer restorative and remedial solutions to environmental damage. The remedy to the, to the damage to the environment may cause Council to implement further enforcement action to appropriately address and resolve this damage through the use of orders, which we will having a look at next. So number five, orders and notices. Orders and notices are written and enforceable undertakings that specify terms and actions required to be complied with and undertaken by the alleged offender. There may be an administration fee payable and attached to the issuing of the order or notice, depending on the relevant applicable legislation. There are a number of different acts which empower local councils to give and issue statutory notices, such as the EP&A Act, the POE, the LGA, the Swimming Pools Act, the Food Act and the Companions Animal Act. Since the introductory of the statutory regimes in 1993 for the LGA and 1998 for the EP&A, there have been a number of decisions handed down by the courts which have clearly articulated the steps that a local council must take when giving these orders. Judgments in the case of Foster and Sutherland Shire Council in 2001 and Cassanidi versus Canada Bay Council in 2002 are amongst the most authoritative judgments on the subject matter and they highlight the benchmark tests that all our local councils must be mindful of when exercising their regulatory powers. Of particular significance is the decision in the Court of Appeal of J&J O'Brien v South Sydney Council, a 2002 decision, which to a certain extent lessened the burden on councils with respect to reasons given in orders. Prior to an order being issued under section 132 of the LGA, all councils must give notice to whom the order is proposed to be given of its intention to give the order, the terms of the proposed order and the period with which the order is to be complied with. The notice must also indicate to the person receiving the order that they are able to make representations to council about why the order should not be given or about the terms of the order or the period of compliance. If representations are made to whom the notice was issued, councils, as per 100, section 135 of the LGA, may determine to give the order in accordance with the proposed order or in accordance with some modifications made to the proposed order, or they can simply not choose to give the order at all. Now let's have a look at the appealable rights and judicial review of notices and orders. Most notices and orders have appealable rights attached to them, thus permitting the recipient of the notice to exercise his or, her, his or her right of appeal to the court. Now this requirement is to be specified on the notice itself and is set out quite clearly in the statute that the legislation applies and the legislation that the offence applies to. However, there is another option for recipients of notices that councils may not be aware of, and it's the option of judicial review. Now, for something like a clean-up notice that in statute doesn't have a clear requirement or a clear appeal rights to the uh, offender, the offender, upon receipt of the notice, may choose to commence proceedings in the Land and Environment Court as a judicial review or review of an administrative decision. This can be brought to question the validity of this decision made by the council. In determining the validity of this decision, the court will not look at whether it was good or bad, 
but whether the original decision maker had the legal power to make the decision and whether the correct legal procedures were followed in making the decision. In a judicial review, the court will not substitute its decision for the original decision maker's decision. Now, this is different from notices such as prevention notices and notices issued under the EPNA Act, where the court quite clearly does actually have that power. Where the court decides that the original decision maker has no power to make the decision in a judicial review, the original decision will be declared invalid and the dispute will end there. However, if the court concludes that the decision maker had the power but did not follow the correct procedures, the original decision maker can decide the matter again, this time following the right procedures. The eventual decision may still be the same with the decision making process adjusted accordingly to reflect the procedural requirements. Now let's have a look at delegation and its requirement and utility in notices and orders. The key plank with respect to exercising any function under any Act for councils is the delegation of the power to a person to perform the function. Section 377 and 378 of the LGA where the are where the powers initially stem from. Authorised officers under the various Acts must ensure that their individual instruments and de of delegated authority of which they have been issued with expressly and quite clearly authorises them and gives them power to issue notices and orders under the Act. If they don't have this authority expressly stated in their delegation, the notice can easily be declared to be invalid. Now let's have a look at the actual terms of notices and orders. In the decision of Foster and Sutherland Shire Council in 2001, the recipient raised the issue of the certainty of an order where the terms of the order were vague and unclear. From this case, the principle was established that a local council must frame its order in a clear and concise and unequivocal manner. Otherwise, it runs the risk of having the orders declared invalid on appeal to the court. Therefore, an order would be invalid if the terms are not clear, concise and unequivocal to order the recipient to do all the necessary things and actions to satisfy the circumstances of the respective tables in 124 of the LGA and 9.34 of the EPNA Act. It is important to note that where an order is given per section 136 of the LGA, a council must give reasons for the order and those reasons are to be given when the order is given, except in the case of urgency. If there is a case of urgency, the reasons may be given by the council the next working day. Now let's have a look at the service and proof that proof of service that is required for notices and orders. The service of orders and notices vary from act to act, though there are some acts which do not provide for service per se. For instance, the relevant provisions with regard to service and orders and notices can be found in section 710 of the LGA and section 10.11 of the EPNA and section 321 of the POE. Orders and notices are useful enforcement options because they formalise the action that needs to be taken by specifying exactly when, how and what needs to be done. They also require minimal to zero legal fees if not appealed and set an enforceable legal framework that may have offence provisions with significant penalties if they're not complied with. However, there are some limitations to the issuing of notices and orders. They can potentially be time consuming to create, enforce and require resources from council to monitor ongoing compliance with notices and orders. In some cases, they may easily be appealed, especially orders issued under the EPA Act, which can further increase the length of the prosecution and add to the legal costs. One specific type of notice that we would like to explore today in this webcast are prevention notices issued under the POE. Prevention notices are intended to address more systemic pollution and waste management problems. There are certain regulatory responsibilities of local councils that can be conducted through a medium of appropriate regulatory authority or otherwise known as an ARA. An ARA can issue a prevention notice if the ARA 
for the activity conducted in an environmentally unsatisfactory manner. Now let's have a look at when the prevention notice can be issued. Prevention notices may be issued by the IRA, ARA when it reasonably suspects that certain activities have been or been conducted in an environmentally unsatisfactory manner, as defined in section 96 of the POE. Who can prevention notices be issued? Prevention notices can be issued to the occupier of the premises concerned and or the person carrying out the activity concerned. The prevention notice can require the persons to take action to ensure the activity is carried out in the future in an environmentally satisfactory manner as per section 96.2 of the POE. Where a notice is given to an occupier but the occupier is not the person carrying out the activity, the occupier must still make, take all available steps to cause the, the action to be taken as per section 96.4 of the POE. Now let's have a little bit of a look at what action can be taken on a prevention notice. A prevention notice should specify action that must be taken to ensure the activities are carried on in an environmentally satisfactory manner. Section 96.3 of the POE lists examples of the types of action which may be taken, including installing, repairing, altering, replacing, maintaining or operating control equipment or other plant, modifying or carrying out any work on a plant, cease to use plant or altering the way plant is used. A prevention notice may also require the recipient to furnish progress reports on the action required to be taken by the notice as per section 96.5 of the POE. Two examples of the directions which can be given by a prevention notice are the direction to occupy an unlicensed sale yard where manure is not being managed in an environmentally satisfactory manner to prepare and submit to the ARA within two months an environmental management report on nutrient control or direction to a person carrying on in an environmentally unsatisfactory way an unlicensed activity to monitor emissions and or discharges and to keep records of monitoring results. Let's have a look at now how is the prevention notice given. It's given in a written form. Now let's move on to the timing and the appeal against a prevention notice. A person may appeal to the Land and Environment Court against a prevention notice within 21 days after being served with the notice as set out in section 289 of the POE. A prevention notice cannot come into force until after 21 days of an appeal being made or after the court has confirmed the notice as per section 99 of the POE. Therefore, a prevention notice is not issued in circumstances where immediate action is required. So, if a quick response is needed, a clean-up notice should be issued instead because a prevention notice cannot require action before 21 days. Failure to comply with a prevention notice. It is an offence of failure to comply with a prevention notice as per section 97 of the POE. The maximum penalty upon conviction is $250,000 for individuals and a million dollars for corporations. The ARA can also bring civil proceedings in the Land and Environment Court to require the person to clean up the action as per section 252 of the POE. Where a notice has not been complied with, the ARA may step in and take action to cause the notice to be complied with under section 98 of the POE and then recover these costs as per section 104. Let's have a look at some case law in relation to prevention notice. Specifically, let's address the issue of reasonable suspicion and what amounts to reasonable suspicion under section 96 of the POE. We'll refer in this instance to the case of Cantarella Brothers and Ride Council, a 2003 decision. Council issued a prevention notice in this case requiring Cantarella Brothers to prepare an outdoor impact assessment report in respect of its coffee bean roasting business. Cantarella Brothers challenged the validity of the notice 
on the grounds that the notice only required an assessment report and did not require a plan of action or other measures to be taken to address the odour issues. McClellan CJ held the notice to be valid as the council had a reasonable suspicion of an odour. And at paragraph 17 of his judgment, he stated, the trigger for the section is a reasonable suspicion, but whether or not any action is necessary cannot depend on mere suspicion. Whether or not action is necessary must depend on some objective determination of the present performance of the premises. An assessment report alone can be required under section 96 of the POE. This is consistent with section 96.3, subparagraph so G. The assessment report may confirm the reasonable suspicion of an activity being carried on in an environmentally unsatisfactory manner, and if so confirmed, the appropriate regulatory authority can take appropriate actions, such as issuing a further notice to rectify the problem. Two main findings can be taken from this case. The first one being an objective determination is required to justify reasonable suspicion that an activity is being carried on in an environmentally unsatisfactory manner. And the second one being that a prevention notice can require an assessment report alone and need not require remediation action or a plan for remedial action. Now let's look at the sixth option in terms of uh, options we can take for enforceable options. This is enforceable undertakings. Enforceable undertakings can be used as an alternative to prosecution and operate as a binding agreement where an offender voluntarily enters into an undertaking to remedy a contravention of the law. The enforceable undertaking may identify a range of tasks that will need to be carried out by the offender to settle the breach of law. This can include payment of penalty notices, environmental restorative works, a public apology, or an apology in a notice, such as the newspaper, of the offence. Enforceable undertakings are an outcome-based enforcement option and actually are not legally enforceable against the alleged offender. Once an enforceable undertaking has been entered into, the alleged offender cannot be prosecuted against the offence related to the undertaking. However, if the offender does, does not comply with the undertaking, further serious action can be implemented, such as commencing proceedings in the Land and Environment Court. In the instance that a prosecution proceeding goes forward, the offender's non-compliance with the undertaking may be used as evidence to establish that the offender both knew and was responsible for the offence. Enforceable undertakings are particularly useful when the offender is actively engaged with taking responsibility for the offence and is willing to cooperate to remedy the consequences of the breach. Using enforceable undertakings as an enforcement option may provide for a quicker and more cost-efficient solution than prosecution. They can also help foster a more cooperative and positive relationship between offenders and counsel, as both parties are provided with the opportunity to negotiate the agreement. On the other hand, enforceable undertakings may not be appropriate in circumstances where the alleged offenders are unwilling to cooperate and would be likely to breach the agreement. The process of negotiation could potentially be time consuming, especially since counsel may be inclined to consult with legal advisers before implementing an enforceable undertaking. Another implication of using an enforceable undertaking is that counsel would not be able to publicise the offence and its consequences to the public as the undertaking is a relatively private process. Therefore, where the offence is of a serious and significant nature, it would be inappropriate to utilise enforceable undertakings since the public would benefit more from a transparent hearing of the offence in court. Number seven, let's have a look at court proceedings in terms of enforcement options. Pursuing a sanction for the offence in a court of law is an effective mechanism to assist in deterring the alleged offender and the wider community from committing future offences. The decision to prosecute is one where the council must consider if it would be in the public interest to do so and if there are alternatives to prosecution that would be better suited to remedying the breach. Once council has made the decision to commence proceedings in a court, there are two avenues 
either in the civil jurisdiction or the criminal jurisdiction. So the first thing Council really needs to ask itself is what type of proceedings should be taken, criminal or civil. In determining the appropriate type of proceedings, much depends in our view on ultimately what Council is trying to achieve in respect to the type of matter that's being investigated. In a situation where a counselling officer is investigating a water pollution runoff from a building site, then he or she might want to obtain an order to compel the site foreman to erect erosion and sediment controls to erect a barrier to divert runoff into a detention pool, or issuing an on-the-spot penalty notice in this instance may not remedy the immediate problem, especially when the foreman bluntly refuses to carry out any remedial works. The appropriate course of action is to issue a clean-up notice or approach the Land and Environment Court for appropriate orders or an injunction if there's a sufficient degree of urgency. Similarly, once a tree has been cut down, then it cannot be replanted and the only viable solution is to prosecute the offence and have the court impose a monetary penalty and seek a revegetation order as part of the sentence. Therefore, much depends upon what the council wants to achieve. Depending upon the particular act the offence falls under, council may want the court not only to make civil orders to get something done, but also to have the offender punished for the crime as well. For example, under the POE, it is possible to take civil and criminal action against the offender. Similar dual actions are available in the EPA Act, but are more limited as any civil orders that are made will preclude the offender from being prosecuted for the same offence. It can often be the case that civil orders can be much more onerous and costly to an offender, as opposed to the offender being convicted or fined or issued with a penalty notice. This is particularly relevant to the demolition of unlawful structures if the respondent has gone albeit foolishly in our view, to the expense and effort to erect the illegal structure and then is made to pull it down. As a general rule of thumb, the remedy and or punishment sought should be proportionate to the seriousness of the offence. Accordingly, minor branch pruning matters might best be dealt with by way of a penalty notice. Major tree lopping and removal or major pollution events, on the other hand, should be sanctioned with court action which, if successful, may result in not only pecuniary fines or orders, but also an ability for the court to order the replant of trees and to carry out environmental restoration. As always, much will depend upon the quality of the evidence to prove the existence of the facts in issue, to ground the offence with which the defendant is charged. Hence, it will always be a matter of discretion exercisable by the counsel, having regard to the fact and degree of the alleged offence. Penalty notices are often most appropriate for a form and punishment for minor matters, though Council should not simply issue a penalty notice to avoid taking down proper evidence and presenting such evidence in court. Once Council has made an informed decision as to whether or not to prosecute alleged offender in the civil or criminal jurisdiction, it is then essential to ask the next question of where to prosecute. Is it more appropriate to commence proceedings in the local court or the Land and Environment Court. Let's have a look at criminal proceedings. When a decision has been taken to prosecute and take minimal action, consideration should be given to selecting the appropriate forum. Two decisive factors will come into play. First, the severity of the crime will invariably dictate the forum or the jurisdiction. If a significant stand of trees were cut down and there was a major water pollution event, then chances are that Council would be far better off taking such matters to the Land and Environment Court where a judge is more likely to have detailed knowledge and expertise with respect to such matters. If the allegations are of a minor tree being removed or minimal pollution, then local court would be the more preferable jurisdiction. Secondly, the probative value of Council's evidence would have significant bearing in selecting between the Superior Land and Environment Court or the inferior local court. It should be noted that irrespective of the court selected, council must have a prima facie case before any proceedings are contemplated. Hence, there might be instances where council simply does not have enough evidence to establish a prima facie case, which will mean the case simply does not get off the ground due to the lack of evidence. Now let's have some regard to the time limitations to commence proceedings. 
When making a choice to commence proceedings, counsel must also be wary of the time period limitations to prosecute. For all offences except indictable offences, there are strict time limits that are specified in each relevant act that counsel must adhere to when commencing proceedings. Ensuring that proper records are taken of when evidence of when the offence is made available to the authorised officer will assist counsel in starting the prosecution within the required time frame. Now let's have regard to selecting the defendant. Oftentimes, liability for the commission of an offence can be linked to a wide net of people, particularly offences in relation to environmental harm and pollution. In situations such as these, it may not be in counsel's best interest, interest to prosecute all those involved who have either participated or contributed to the carrying out of the offence. Rather, counsel may opt to select the most appropriate defendant by considering and identifying who is the person chiefly responsible for the carrying out and commission of the offence, what role the proposed defendant was and the likelihood of obtaining a conviction against the proposed defendant. So let's have a look at now the civil proceedings and injunctions that can be sought in the Land and Environment Court. There will be times where counsel's interest and the public interest is best served with interlocutory orders being made in the Land and Environment Court using its equitable powers to issue either, issue either a probatory injunction or restrain a person from doing something or a mandatory injunction to compel a person to do something. The local court in this instance has no jurisdiction to make remedial orders of this nature. Acts like the LGA, EPNA and POE have provisions to enable counsel to take civil proceedings to remedy a restraint of breach. These remedies are always at the sole discretion of counsel and the following factors in our view come into play with respect to the exercise of this discretion. Whether there is a serious case to be tried, whether there is irreparable damage such as environmental harm and is likely to continue and or ensue whether the balance of convenience favours counsel, whether there will or will not be an undertaking as to damages given by the counsel seeking the interlocutory relief. In determining whether or not to grant the relief, the court will require the counsel to adduce evidence which on the balance of probabilities in relation to whether there is a serious case to be tried and the irreparable damage, as well as the balance of convenience, in relation to an undertaking as to damages, this remains a matter for counsel to demonstrate to the court that it ought not to give an undertaking on the grounds that it is a public authority. Ordinarily, the counsel, the court, I should say, will require the counsel to give an undertaking as to damages. Interlocutory injunctions can be sought for a range of remedies, which include things like unlawful tree and vegetation removal, unauthorised earthworks and excavation and landfilling unlawful binding work such as works carried out without any consent, pollution of watercourses and apprehended or threatened lawful, unlawful use of premises. In addition to interlocutory relief, the Council can pursue non-interlocutory civil enforcement action against any person whom it suspects has breached a statutory provision. The disadvantage of going down the civil path rather than a prosecutorial or criminal path is that the offender will be made to take some kind of affirmative action to fix the problem. Punishment does not necessarily achieve the same result. If a court makes an order for a person to demolish part or all of his building, the results are tangible and indirectly punitive, especially if the unlawful works have cost the offender thousands of dollars. Further, if civil orders are disobeyed, the offender is likely to face separate contempt charges, which are quasi-criminal and have serious consequences should the court make such a finding. However, it is important for counsel to note that prosecutions as an enforcement option can be a relatively lengthy process involving a certain degree of risk due to the uncertainty of the outcome. If the pursuit of a prosecution is unsuccessful, there is the possibility of extensive legal costs to counsel. And with all of this being said today, this will conclude our topics of enforcement options in today's webcast. We thank you for registering and we thank you for listening. Now I can see that we've got some time for questions. Uh, the first question is somebody from Adrian at Parramatta Council. 
And it says here, did I understand that right? An enforceable undertaking is not actually enforceable. Yes, it's probably not the best use of words. An enforceable undertaking is what it means. It's not enforceable in a court sense, if, I'd like, if you want to use that description or that definition of enforceable. It's an undertaking. A way that I usually like to describe it to people is if you have uh, something like a personal apprehended violence order against somebody, the parties may not want to agree to the terms of an apprehended violence order because they are quite serious on a person's liberty. There is an option in that scenario for the alleged offender to save himself or herself the expense of legal proceedings um, to agree to an undertaking. Now, this undertaking is generally speaking between the parties and it essentially is more or less an undertaking not to behave or not to uh, partake in the behaviour that caused the um, breach or in relation to the unlawful activity. It is something that can be recorded for counsel's purposes and can be used against the offender if the offender actually commits a further crime in relation to the offence. So it's probably not best described as an enforceable undertaking in the court sense of the word, but an enforceable undertaking to be used as maybe a precursor or as a step um, to actually instigating proceedings. Now, the next question we have oh, is in relation to notices or orders. Can the terms in the notices or orders be set out in stages? And the specific wording here is time stages. Yes. If, for example, I think a good example is maybe in a prevention notice where you may want them to carry out certain testing um, or to provide uh, some kind of a report, a remedia remedial action report may need to be provided in relation to works. So that report may need to be provided within, say, 28 days or whatever time frame you think is suitable. And the next step um, is for that report to be reviewed by council and approved with steps thereafter in relation to the implement, implementation of the works to be carried out in that report. And I think we've got time for one more question, or probably two. Um, and this always comes up uh, in relation to clean-up notices and whether or not a notice of intention needs to be issued. Now, you'll all be familiar with those of you who utilise um, the POE, is that under that Act, there is actually no statutory-based requirement to issue a notice of intention. There is a significant amount of case law on this issue which suggests that if, it, if the threat of environmental harm is imminent, then you should issue a notice of intention to issue a clean-up note... Oh, sorry, I reverse that. You don't have to issue a notice of intention to issue a clean-up notice. However, if the threat of environmental harm, potentially water pollution, for example, is not imminent or urgent, then case law suggests um, that the offenders should be afforded a procedural fairness and natural justice and council should issue a notice of intention before issuing um, a final enforce notice. And there's one more question, oh, which is whether or not there will be a link to the information contained in this webcast. Um, Yes, we can arrange that and I've got your email address here um, so we can forward that information on um, after this webcast. Thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a lovely day. If you have any further questions, you are more than welcome um, to email them and we can uh, give you some responses on a personal basis.